Hello, welcome to another edition of the Fitter and Faster Coaches Corner. I'm your host, as always, Mike Murray, and today I'm thrilled to speak with one of the finest coaches in American swimming today, my friend, the head coach of the Pinecrest School and the Pinecrest Swim Club, Marius Pochklaskani. How are you, coach? Doing well. Uh, kind words, Mike. I, a little exaggerated, not a little, a lot, but <laughs> appreciated. Well, you can give me a hard time for chopping up your last name if I did it. I've known you for so many years now, and I never get it right. You know what? I, I, I know people that, that know me for 30 years, and they still say, you know, however it comes up. So I, <laughs> no offense whatsoever. I'm glad when people talk to me. Coach, you were a two-time Olympian for Poland. You finished fifth in both the 1500 and 400 meter freestyle at the 1988 Olympic Games. In the prelims of the 400 free, and not many people know this about you, but in the prelims, you actually broke the Olympic record. And we're going to get into that today because I want to hear that story. I think that's a remarkable story. And uh, athletes can glean a lot off of your experience from that. You also enjoyed great success at the collegiate level winning the mile at NCAAs as a freshman at the University of Arizona and coming within 22 one hundredths of the NCAA record at the time. Your transition to coaching started where your swimming career ended at the University of Arizona. From there, you took a head coaching job at Oregon State before moving down to Florida and heading up Miami's program. And today you are the aquatics director of Pinecrest Swimming and the national coach at the Pinecrest location. Marius, I know that you are a big lover of all things Florida, and it has been a tough week in Florida. Not only are you guys dealing with the complications from COVID, but now you have a hurricane mixed in there, and the state meet is just uh, a week away. So how are you guys handling all of these things? You know, honestly, the first thing that comes to your mind is, are we surprised? No, it's 2020. Uh, you know, just when you think you're dealing with one thing and you're getting a handle on it, something else happens. And, uh, you know, hurricane season typically should be over in, in October. Uh, you know, this is highly unusual. And, and we're walking on eggshells trying to keep our athletes healthy, focused, and away from uh, uh, potential uh, uh, issues with quarantine. Um, so there are a lot of things that we have on our plate and then the hurricane comes in and uh, you know, we have to be out of the water for a couple of days. So nothing is perfect. You know, I think when the season is all said and done, we're gonna reflect and smile. But for now, it's been just a lot of stress, a lot of stress over things you really can't control. How are you coaching your coaches through the process helping them navigate these times? Because it's not just about the athletes, right? You have a family of coaches that work alongside you at Pinecrest. So how are you mentoring them through this time? You know, I, I think we mentor each other. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a constant conversation. How are we dealing with this? How are we dealing with that? Um, you know, I, I don't think I've got a wisdom to be able to pass it on because I've, nobody's ever been through that. Uh, the only wisdom that I can offer is, uh, you know, that experience teaches you throughout the years that if you focus on things that you can control, if you focus on at this time, especially of, on, on kids um, and, and, and take it day at a time, that's how you get through, through it. You know, if you just try to get ahead and, and plan too far ahead at this time, it, 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 it does create issues and disappointments. So, you know, we, we're really coaching towards goals, but we're focusing on things day at a time and, and trying to deflect and not worry about things that we can control like this hurricane. I mean, it's a source of frustration, but the first thing that needs to happen is that comes up, you know, how do you deal with it? What do you do? How do we overcome that rather than, oh no, not again. So it, it just staying positive and staying, staying focused on why we're doing this. No doubt about it. And, and through that struggle too, one of the things that you and I have, have shared over the last couple of years is coaching our own children and some of the challenges that, that go on with that. And congratulations to you and Julia. Some phenomenal swims this past week for her, breaking two minutes in the IM, getting under 54 in the 100 back. Really great performances. Share with us some of your insights into coaching your own children, some of the challenges involved, and, and what makes it great and what makes it such a, a challenge at times. Uh, you know, what makes it great is a journey. Uh, you know, this, this is going to be a, you know, I got one child, so this is, this is going to be over soon when she goes to college. So for me, this is just an everyday memory-making process. Um, 
every situation is going to be different, and I really can't give uh, anybody a, a, a path to success. It all depends on a lot of different circumstances. But having said that, one of the things that we've done, uh, my wife swam as well, so we both done from the very young age when Julia was just starting in a sport. Uh, we were all about hugs and kisses. Uh, Julia didn't hear a word from me about coaching or swimming. Um, uh, you know, uh, our coaches, they coached uh, uh, Julia before, and most recently, Danny Palmiata, our head uh, age group coach, did a phenomenal job with her. And my job as a, as, as a, as a dad, uh, and my wife's job was, you know, regardless of what happens, give her a hug, love you, that was great, and, you know, no swimming talk, which, you know, set up a better relationship for me and her now because I've developed a strong father-daughter relationship before we moved on to, uh, uh, you know, coach and swimmer. And January 1, she moved into my group and we right away get a COVID and all the issues. So, uh, you know, it's been interesting. Uh, but I do think that what helped uh, uh, our relationship, which I, I'll be honest with you, we got off to a rocky start. Um, we, uh, you know, I, I sat down with her in January and I said, listen, um, swimming is going to be swimming, home is going to be home. And I got that from many other coaches that went through that. We will not bring up swimming at home. So if there are issues that we need to discuss, they're going to be discussed in the office. And I would say in the first four weeks, there were a lot of tears in the office. You know, I don't want you to be my coach. I want you to be my father, you know, because the, the level of the relationship changes. Uh, you know, and she was hearing things from me that, you know, she wasn't used to hearing. And in all honesty, the best thing that happened for our relationship was COVID, believe it or not. Because that's where, you know, she got really upset and hungry for being able to swim. We couldn't do it. We started out as a family running in the mornings and doing dry land and putting her in our backyard pool and cords. And then I was able to spend not normal amount of time because time was limited going to public pools, but just being 101 rather than in a group setting. In a group setting, I, um, you know, I, I, I don't distinguish, uh, uh, you know, among swimmers and I try not to allow her being my daughter play any role in, 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 on a pool day. So me being able to coach her 101 for three, four months almost, uh, really build a different uh, level of relationship and different understanding, which I, I think is, you know, is now helping us because I, I can tell you that past few months, once we got back into training, uh, our relationship has been great. She's been a, uh, an outstanding um, worker and listener, which she wasn't before. Well, she was a great worker and, and, and listener, just not with me. And finding that line is always interesting and fun and challenging at the same time. So that sounds like you guys have a good connection moving forward. And how awesome, because she's just really starting to blossom and it's going to be fun to watch her the next couple of years. You know, I, I hope so. Uh, you know, we, we talk about the journey. She, you know, she asks questions about the future. And I, you know, another thing that we keep doing is, is trying to keep her grounded on right here, right now in the process and not try to get ahead. Um, you know, the, obviously she's a sophomore. The question about colleges come up and, uh, you know, she asks for our advice and I tell her, listen, you're going to have, crazy time dealing with all of that because it, it, it you know nowadays when you're a junior it, those kids are getting bombarded with you know recruiting materials and questions and everybody's going to be your friends and i said you know listen you've got time let's not even talk about it this is this should not be on your radar state meet should be or this you know this practice should be so we we're doing everything that we can to deflect any kind of um stressful focus on too far ahead absolutely and something that you're able to rely on as far as the skill set goes is you've been a teacher for a long time. What you know, teacher by accident. Uh, when I left UM, um, you know, when I started working with Jay Fitzgerald, whom I'm known, by the way, I've known Jay for now going on 35 years. We still, uh, um, you know, meet on a weekly basis, sometimes twice a week. We have dinners on Wednesday and Saturday. So we've been very close. And, uh, you know, when I came on board, um, you know, full-time position had to be combined with teaching and you know and uh, so I just kind of became a teacher by accident and I started kind of low couple of classes but then he started expanding expanding 
uh, you know, and it's been a it's been a great journey. I think that being a teacher, you know, probably the most important thing they taught me is that uh, uh, you cannot apply a blanket in a classroom, and you cannot apply a blanket in a, in, a, in in a pool. You know, every person is going to be a different learner, and you know, our jobs as coaches is to find the path to connect with that athlete. And you know, those connections are going to take time. But more importantly, uh, you know, those connections are not going to work if we try to treat, you know, Jane the same way as we treat Jimmy and the same way we treat Ryan. You know, they're, they're all going to have a different way to which they're going to respond. And our job is to find that way. I think it's so incredible that you're able to balance both of those responsibilities, being a full-time coach and a full-time teacher, because they take so much of our time away from our family. So what are some strategies that, that you and Dagmara use to make sure you stay connected uh, throughout the week, throughout the month, throughout the year? All right, so first of all, I'm not teaching anymore because when Jay retired three years ago, combining those two positions is impossible because we have two campuses, we have uh, 11 coaches, we have lessons programs, all of it needs to be uh, organized and, and supervised. So, uh, you know, you can't teach anymore. And I do miss that because walking on campus I see swimmers, I know swimmers, but I used to know pretty much all the kids and you know, I was able to interact with them. Now I'm you know, just kind of a, a, a coach on a site that people might know who I am, but I don't know who they are. Uh, but as far as uh, you know, uh, connecting and keeping everything kind of uh, together uh, and organizing our time, I think one of the reasons why we both ended up at Pinecrest or in the same place, and Pinecrest has been wonderful in that way, is that we can do it all in one place. You know, uh, my wife teaches here. I see her. She comes by the office. I, you know, we can have lunch together. We see each other during the day. So we have a lot of interactions. Um, you know, we see our daughter uh, a little less now. You know, she's a high schooler and teenager. She still comes by the office, you know, two or three times a day. But it used to be a little, you know, a little different. Now, obviously, you know, uh, you know, her interest is going to change. And uh, uh, we don't want to interfere with her having her social world away from us. For sure. And, and as they grow, right, and you see the changes happening in your house and at practice, there are times where you have to switch that hat from being the dad hat to the coach hat. And, and what are some things that you do to, to get yourself ready for those transitions? Uh, you know what? <laughs> You're going to laugh when you say that, but uh, I watch a lot of old races, um, especially with her. Uh, you know, and, and that's my bridge between being a coach and a dad, because I enjoy watching this as a dad. But when I watch those videos, uh, uh, you know, I, I also start criticizing or not criticizing, but start breaking it down and looking at things where we can do better. And, and, you know, that's been a great way for me, especially during the pandemic now to, to stay sharp and, and, and be able to make connect, make those two words connect, because it was very difficult when, you know, when you spend 24 seven during the pandemic with somebody, uh, you know, it, it's, it become very one dimensional. And, you know, uh, we couldn't leave things at the pool, but I still needed to coach her at home. I still needed to, uh, uh, you know, go for a run with her, do dry land and put her in the pool. Uh, so this was very, very uh, important for me to make those two worlds connect and bridge. Certainly. And, and it's hard, right? It's hard at times when you want to uh, interject as the dad and then you want to interject as the coach at the same time. And that takes a lot of practice. It, it does. And, you know, one thing that I've probably done a very poor job is that, you know, I know some people um, ask their kids to call them coach on a pool deck. Um, uh, Julia doesn't call me coach. She doesn't call me my first name. Um, she calls me Tata in Polish, always. Um, she doesn't call me daddy. She calls me Tata. That's, that's uh, you know, that in Polish. So, um, uh, and, um, you know, from my standpoint, um, I always call her, you know, her cute name as well in practice. And, uh, you know, occasionally I call it Julia, but I usually call her Yulcha, which is our little, you know, uh, uh, term of endearment, you know, that, that, you know, that we use. So that's probably not a good thing because that keeps both worlds kind of connected. 
but uh, you know, I don't think it's been really uh, hindering, uh, uh, you know, our ability to function uh, uh, as a father, coach, and 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 a swimmer. So, Marius, g- growing up in Poland and being an age group swimmer there, and eventually a, a senior superstar before coming to the United States, what are some of the things that you learned? Uh, in Poland that maybe you brought to the U.S. that we don't necessarily do in our age group development program here? You know what? I I don't know if I can, um, you know, I'll tell you one thing, one thing that we've done from the very young age in Poland was movements. Um, You know, we we talk about, especially, you know, uh, uh, all the coaches talk about how kids nowadays don't uh, have a hard time uh, functioning out of the water hand-eye coordination, movement, feet movement. You know, we, we grew up, you know, quote unquote, climbing trees. We've done a lot of things. Kids nowadays don't do those kinds of things. But even with those things in Poland, I remember from the very young age, we played games. We uh, went to the uh, gym and we did, uh, uh, you know, different exercises that were um, uh, geared not not weightlifting or anything just just movement gymnastics movements you know uh we did a lot of that stuff growing up which really helps you uh, understand your body be able to connect that and i think that it transferred a lot easier for me uh being in the water and you know and being able to correct things because i was really in touch with every little piece of my body you know my coach told me get your fingertips down do something i was able to connect that fairly quickly you know, we didn't have resources, cameras, we didn't have those kinds of things, uh, you know, uh, but because we've done so much of that out of the water, I was really in touch with every little aspect of my body. And, and it was easy for me to make those adjustments and corrections. I think that's one thing that I look back and I we, we've done a really good job growing up in Poland, really good job. So they spent a lot of time developing a physical or physical literacy. So you had an entire library of great athletic movement that led to the creation, let's be honest, in your era of a lot of great middle distance and distance swimmers. I mean, your era in Poland, there were some great athletes coming up. Talk about what it was like to come up with some of those great superstars. You know, so uh, the, the interesting connection between that was that we've had a lot of good swimmers in Poland that would grow up um, and, uh, do okay on the international arena, but uh, you know, uh, for one reason or the other, the competition that we were exposed to was not always uh, conducive. You know, there were limitations in a, in a federation with money, so we were not going to meet. Especially young kids, we're not going to meet because there were no funds. So you had to kind of break through to go there. And once you got there, you know. Uh, uh, for some of them, especially if, if, if you only had one, two shots at it, and then if you didn't make it, you were moved to the side, it was difficult to make it. So for us, the real breakthrough was come to the United States. And the breakthrough was, you know, there was a group that came ahead of me, uh, Artur Wojtek and Wojtek Vizga, both of them swimming college, both of them live in the United States now, but Artur was our first uh, big star that, that uh, came through that kind of program. And, and uh, you know, I didn't understand, you know, how quite, how important that was for us to do that until I got here. And I always tell everybody that, you know, I'm not taking away from anything that I've done in Poland because it, it prepared me for what came my way. But coming to the United States, and I was in Mission Viejo in 86, starting in 86, every practice was a race. Every practice was a competition. We didn't have that at home. You needed to go out to get it and, you know, uh, it was very difficult to find it at that level. Um, and the second thing that was very, very important, I think that, you know, growing up in the communism, uh, even though you're very driven, uh, you also look, uh, you know, at somebody that's trying to do more than others, kind of not in a favorable way. Um, and one thing that, uh, you know, when I came to the United States, not only it was super competitive and it was very difficult to uh, stay there, but once you made it, success was being celebrated. And, you know, and, and that kind of uh, propels you to, to go to the next level, next level and continue. And uh, uh, so we had a lot of great swimmers. Arthur Boyd, that is a perfect example of that. But I do believe the combination of both at that time 
is what made it. Obviously, when the wall went down, communist mended, you know, we still had Polish swimmers coming over, but a lot of them stayed with Otilia winning a gold medal, breaking over the world record, you know. So Polish swimming has a, a lot of bright spots, but at that time, that formula is what worked for us. How have you taken some of those principles that you just discussed and put it into the program at Pinecrest? Certainly Jay had established a great culture there, but what have you done from your experience going through that age group development program in Poland, going to the University of Arizona and swimming for multiple Hall of Fame coaches there, uh, having your experience at Mission Viejo, how have you taken those different pieces and put them into the program at Pinecrest? Um, you know, so, you know, we, we, are, we are doing movements from a young age with kids. Uh, that's probably one thing that we know we have a phenomenal uh, uh, staff here and, uh, and especially our weightlifting staff um, uh, with Coach Hibbs, uh, who is a football uh, uh, guy, but he is so engaged and so uh, um, informed about what swimmers need so we, we're doing that from the young age. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that we're doing among all of our coaches is trying to connect groups, vocabulary, how we do things. Everybody's going to have a little different um, approach to things. But in general, we are trying to fit everything, uh, uh, you know, so the pieces connecting between the groups uh, build a nice continuation rather than, uh, you know, kids moving from group to group, to trying to relearn that. You know, in Poland, system is a little different because in Poland, you have, uh, at times, you have uh, uh, groups that, um, uh, you know, going to go uh, from point A to point Z and connect. But most of the time, what happens is once you get to a, um, and that was the case before, once you get to a certain level, kids switch teams. And, you know, they switch teams uh, and go to different towns. They live in the dormitories and... Uh, so it's really, a, you know, programs like lab teams where you have the continuation in Poland are not very, very um, uh, well developed. Um, so for us, it was important that we develop the continuity. And, and last thing, probably not, but, but not the least, is um, I've never believed in beating somebody into success. I'm not the kind of person, and that's what we preach to our kids. We're not, we're not the program that's going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, try to force anybody to be something they're not. We're going to give them tools. We're going to motivate them. We are going to uh, uh, hold them accountable. But we cannot want something more than they do. So our job as coaches is to develop that fire within and then cultivate that fire to lead, you know, them to the success. Not, and, you know, we always talk about it. Not, you know, we talked about it many times with you, but, um, you know, among coaches is... You know, this is this is not about swimming only. This this goes way beyond. This, those are life lessons, uh, you know, that 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 gonna transpire throughout their life in anything they're gonna do down the road. So, hopefully, we're doing a good job with that, and we send kids, you know, into the colleges and then beyond, ready to tackle the next level. It's been fun to watch the power dynamic in Florida over the last 25, 30 years with a lot of the prep schools. So whether it's Gulliver, Pinecrest, Bowles, St. Andrews, all powerful swimming schools, what's it like to be in that environment and to have a good rivalry that drives the success of each program? Oh, we hate it. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. You know, the, when you ask any of our coaches, when you ask any of our swimmers, these are the most exciting three months of the year. First of all, all programs, uh, uh, Ball, St. Andrews, Gulliver, uh, you know, and, and others beyond have a tremendous respect for one another. Um, they're all unique in its own way and they're all uh, very successful. Um, you know, so competition is absolutely there, but there is a mutual respect that, you know, that goes beyond the three months, uh, uh, you know, that we spent together. But the three months is really what drives the next month, nine months. And, and in all honesty, we all try to figure out how do we duplicate the three months of high school season beyond. Uh, and it's, it's very difficult because, you know, everybody is on their A game during those three months. Everybody's trying to do better and be better. The, the high school season in Florida connects those athletes to a lot of positive emotions that evoke great performances. 
And what we try to do here in the North, because it's a little different, is high school is very important to a lot of our athletes, but we have to get them to see beyond the state meet, which for many of them, that's the Olympic Games. And that's great. We want them to be motivated. But at the same time, we want to keep that door for higher level success open. So how do you talk to your program about that? You know, so th this is actually, this is where you guys have a little easier than we do. Because we live in a, we, we call it a bubble, you know, and, and it really is. Um, very, you know, our families in South Florida, I'm not used to going anywhere for swim meets. There are so many pools, so many opportunities. Everybody wants to stay locally. So the biggest thing is to try to get us out of the bubble, you know, to get different uh, competition, to see, to make them see, uh, you know, uh, uh, other parts of the, of the United States and how people swim. So, you know, one of the greatest things that happened that I, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of, of is uh, futures. You know, futures meet really allowed us to have meaningful travel meets, especially for South Florida, where we get out, we're still going to be competitive in that first step outside of the sectional meet and so forth, you know, because before that it was difficult. You, you know, you can take people to go to juniors uh, and it took some convincing to, you know, to get people to go to juniors. But when you go to juniors and the only need, you know, of, of you know, of, of uh, meaningful nature before was sectionals, that is a huge gap, huge gap. And, you know, you go from, you know, getting a, a top three at sectionals, you go to juniors and you're number 65 after prelims. And, you, you know, you're looking around trying to figure out what just happened. Uh, so they can be very demotivating. So building the bridge with futures was huge. And then trying to send as many kids and, and keep pushing them to, uh, uh, you know, go outside of their bubble has been something that we've been really, you know, trying to uh, make part of our culture here, which, you know, I think every club team in, a, in a South Florida struggles with that. They can tell you about every single swimmer that we compete about against here. They go to swimming, they know exactly what's going to happen. So getting them out of their comfort zone is, is, is part of what we try to do. And how do you celebrate some of that success, Marius? Because you and I were very fortunate to have Marta and Michaela coming up at the same time. So we got to spend a lot of time together in Colorado Springs at Grand Prix meets. Marta went on to have an exceptional career. Uh, oh, look at Michaela, come on. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, how, how have you used her as a, a positive example and role model in your program to help drive that success? You know, so, so you know, we, we, we keep connected with our athletes in college and we try to uh, give our kids updates. But the biggest thing that we try to sell, uh, you know, to our swimmers is, you know, look at the journey, look at the path, you know. And, and this is a kid that started, you know, crawling in our program. You know, uh, Marta came in, she knew how to swim. She was a pretty good swimmer, but she was not a year-round swimmer. So going through the stages, you know, she really took every step in our program to get where she was. And we had other swimmers that went through that, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, you know, like Jessica Nava, who is at, at, uh, at Virginia right now. So, you know, we, we try to make sure the kids understand that just because they are at certain level when they nine, it doesn't mean they can be at the next level when they 13, 14, 15. And just stressing to them the importance of their own journey and bringing examples of people that went through a similar journey. Um, you know, when you look at, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to, I don't like using Julia as an example, but I'm going to use her just, just, you know, Julia was a, uh, you know, blow bubble swimmer, uh, you know, scraped the bottom of the pool till she was about 11 or 12, you know, and, and at that time she was still fighting to try to make uh, jails. Uh, you know, and, and you don't have to be a superstar at the age of nine. You should not try to be a superstar at the age of nine. Make sure that you do all the things along the way to set you up for later. You know, those are the kind of investments. They're going to start paying dividend later on. Um, you know, if, if somebody gets ahead earlier and they're ready for the next stage, by all means. But one thing that we do that on our program that's very, very important is we try to celebrate um, each level. We don't allow anybody to move on. So Julia was an age grouper with Olympic trial cuts. She was not a senior group. She was not in a national group. She was in a G2 with her peers. 
And, you know, and when she moves on, somebody else is going to fill that gap and somebody else is going to step up and, 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 you know, start getting confident because of being around swimmers that, you know, that are their peers. So we make sure that it's not a performance that dictates where they go, but it's their age and especially their, their emotional development. That brings us to a great segue here, and that's parent education, because a lot of parents who might have an athlete at Julia's level at her age are going to advocate that she move up to the higher level training group just as a result of having junior national cuts. And at you as a coach, you have a little bit more information. You understand the process a little bit more. But how are you educating your parents at Pinecrest to trust the process, follow the pattern of development, and let the coaches coach? You know, so I, I, I think that one of the good things or great things about Pinecrest is that, uh, you know, especially those that go to school here, is that once they get dropped off, it's out of mind. You know, parents, parents, once they get to be, you know, uh, um, at the uh, green two level, they're not on a pool deck. So they detach themselves. And uh, we try to educate them early. And by default, because of the setup, they remove themselves, which has been very, very helpful for us to be able to really build a, a different relationship with those athletes and advocate the process that we uh, want them to go through. Um, you're always going to have some parents they're going to question that, but you know once you set the precedent, and we haven't had anybody leave our program because we didn't move them to the next level, even though they might have been ready. So uh, you know I think that starting early, and being able to really uh, capitalize on the setup that we have, allowed us you know uh, for that. You know parents don't get on campus, um, uh, especially now. Uh, they pick them up and drop them off at the circle. Uh, you know, we don't have uh, parents watching practices during the school year when normal, uh, normal situation, we're going to have parents that are going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, nine, 10 year olds, they're going to be coming in here maybe before, you know, to see how they're doing. But uh, it's been great. You know, parents been really hands off and, and trusting our process. And um, once you get that going, it becomes easier because uh, again, every year you're getting a new group of parents going through it. And I think that our parents, especially all the kids' parents, are very helpful educating them about, hey, just trust the process, let things go, the path that they co the coaches are picking for your kid. That's one of the biggest challenges is trying to be patient as a coaching staff and realizing that, hey, these folks don't have the same level of knowledge that you do. And I think a, a mistake that I made as a younger coach was assuming that they understood the process, right? And, and it takes time. It, it takes time. And, you know, I think that one thing that really helps us is the unified message. You know, because sometimes, uh, you know, you get in a situation where, uh, uh, you know, you just want to tell parents what they want to hear, uh, but it's not always what they should hear. And as long as the message is consistent and it's the same from the very young age, uh, you know, sooner or later, they'll buy into it. I'm not saying everybody, uh, you know, but just like with, with culture, just like with what you have in your program, it's not about getting everybody on board. You're never going to get everybody on board. But if the odds are in your favor, then the, uh, you know, the outliers are not influential and are not necessarily uh, creating any distraction, you know, to, to what we're trying to do. And how are you advising your coaches who might have athletes in your program? How are you, how are you helping mentor them through coaching their own athletes through your own experience? You know what? Uh, we don't have any yet. Um, we have one coach on, on our Boca campus, which uh, uh, he is now, he's coached, uh, he's stepped some for a couple of years. Um, and he's done a phenomenal job and he's probably the best guy for the job because he is the Dr. Feelgood, the, you know, the, the, you know, the warm and cozy guy, uh, you know, high fives and, 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 and things like that. So he, uh, you know, was coaching uh, at Swimmer for the past two years and now he's in this situation with us with a different coach. So we really don't have, I'm, I'm kind of an experiment right now, but I, I know he's coming because uh, we have um, younger coaches that are you know going to be having kids and hopefully staying with Pinecrest because they were, you know we have a phenomenal staff uh uh most of our coaches actually you know this is an interesting 
fact, most of our coaches somehow came through the ranks, uh, the younger coaches came through the ranks of uh, being connected um, through camps that we used to run. And, you know, we used to call our overnight camp the world's greatest uh, interview process. Because <laughs> anybody that can survive seven weeks of 24 seven with kids nonstop. And, you know, it's not just coaching, it's everything that you do. You, 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 you're supervising them, you do all kinds of things. We don't do those camps anymore, but, you know, so our camp, our, our coaching staff uh, uh, develop a great relationship early. We got to know the hardest working people in the, in the business and they're now with us. So I do hope they stay. Um, uh, and, you know, but I know that, you know, one is married, the other one is getting married, others going to think about it and, you know, family is going to start popping up. So soon I'm going to be reflecting on my experience with Julia and, you know, hopefully providing them with the, with the guidance. But, uh, you know, every situation is going to be different. So uh, I, I just hope that they, they early develop a good relationship as a father. Uh, why I mean, father, mother, and 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 uh, and the kids before they move on to the coaching. That's probably the the biggest thing they got to do. Marius, how do you and the coaching staff create continuity between you? Is there a lot of communication, staff meetings? What are some development things that you're doing with your coaches? So you know, uh, for better or for worse, um, we have a beautiful facility, but we cannot. Uh, uh, have different hours of practice. All our practices are at the same time. So we are on the pool deck at the same time. We talk constantly, we interact, we watch kids, which great with the, which, which is great with, uh, uh, you know, kids moving from one group to another because we know them all, we've seen them all, uh, you know, and, and we, you know, we have coaches on the pool deck coming up. Hey, look at this. I have a, you know, issue with this uh, part of the stroke and we all collaborate. We talk about it. So I think our biggest classroom is literally the pool deck and the interaction that we do during the practices. We talk outside, uh, you know, uh, now it's a little different because with COVID we have different uh, uh, um, duties on campus, but typically, you know, we have a, a time in the office, uh, uh, you know, I share office with our age group coach and we have another office right up on the pool deck uh, that we do spend a lot of time together. And uh, despite trying, you always somehow veer towards swimming. I'm sure. I'm sure those conversations uh, go towards swimming more often than not. And that's another great segue because I want to ask you about some of the legend of Marius as the college swimmer, because I know that when you were at Arizona, you completed a pretty legendary set that those of us like at Victor who are a little bit more old school can appreciate. I heard that at one time in practice, you did three 1000s descend cool. on 11 minutes with paddles, buoy, and a tube. And you went 945, 924, 854 on the last one, where you even split 428, 428. Is this legendary story <laughs> true? That story is true. And uh, one of our coaches at Arizona reminds me of it every year, Jim Lutz. Um, uh, you know, I can't even tell you exactly where the lane was, uh, you know, and I remember looking at it and, you know, I had, I had the big, big old paddles. I had number fives, um, you know, and I, the interesting part is that, you know, one, you did different things during those days, but I, I did almost no weights. You know, I, I don't recall having any kind of sustainable period of doing weights. So my strength and conditioning, uh, uh, came in the water, came from wearing paddles. So, and I love paddles. I love, you know, because uh, being a, a lengthy guy, uh, you know, not to say that my, you know, that I was an athletic, I thought I was, but my core was never developed and I was not a kicker. So by default, swimming, uh, you know, for me, it was very difficult, not, it was different because with the two big kick, you know, it was it was very difficult for me to maintain my body position. When you put pool boy on me, that eliminated me having to keep my hips up. Now, when you put a tube on me, even though the tube was inflated and, and he dragged a lot of water behind it, it was helping keep my feet up. So all I had to focus on is, is moving my arms fast. And that came very natural and easy for me. So that set was, it, it's true, I did that. Um, 
you know, in all honesty, I, I, uh, I'm very proud of it, but I, I wouldn't call it my, uh, my toughest set that I've ever done. And, uh, you know, somehow it became, <laughs> became the one that that's, you know, that, that people mention. Well, to break nine minutes on the last uh, thousand of three one thousands on 11 is pretty good. As, as you know, we do do that test set um, throughout the course of the year. We've had some great ones in the 20s. Uh, I think one time we had an athlete going 19 in there, but uh, that that performance, I had to make sure that I verified <laughs> it and uh, that legendary performance went down. Um, Marius, you were the Olympic record holder for 10 hours mm -hmm. after the prelims. And was that in 88? 88, correct. So you are you are now, after prelims, you're the top seed going into finals at the Olympic Games. Talk to me about what it was like from the moment after that swim to the time where you were getting ready to dive in for the final. Because as an athlete, when you do something like that, and it's not like you came out of nowhere, but an unlikely top seed going into that final. Talk about some of the pressure that came with that, how you handled it in the moment, and then pivot to tell us what you learned from that and how you coach athletes in similar situations. Um, so, you know, first, first of all, going to Olympics, my goal was to be top eight. That was my dream. I was seated right outside of the top 10, so going to Olympics, my only dream was to make top eight. 200 freestyle ahead of that was a warm up. I, like I said, I was not a kicker. So 200 freestyle for me was a, a, not an event that I could really make a difference. So when I dove in the water and I remember I was swimming um, in the lane with, um, I believe Thomas Farner, um, and it was a German guy, you know, this embarrassing that I remember his name. Um, he was a reigning world champion at that time. He was a he, he wasn't a top seed. Arturo was a top seed, but I was in a seated heat, just an outside lane. And I just remember that I told myself in my head, if I finish top two in that heat, I have a shot to be in a final. That was the only thing in my head. So I remember swimming next to next to him, and um, at the two hundred mark, I'm right next to him and uh you know and i feel good so i i stepped up and you know and i i ended up touching the wall and i won the heat i didn't even look at the time that i went and i you know i i was just throwing pumps because i knew if, if i want this heat it's a seated heat i'm going i'm going to the final that's the only thing that mattered people had to get my attention to turn you know make me look at the board because you know, the board was flashing uh, uh, NOR, NOR, New Olympic record. And, you know, and I, that's how I learned. I learned like maybe 10 seconds after I touched the wall that I broke an Olympic record. And the rush of emotions at that time, uh, I don't think it was overwhelming compared to the rush of emotions of knowing that I'm going to the final because that was my dream. So, but things then changed drastically. You know, Arthur um, was the... Uh, flagship of our of our swimming program and um you know he was going in into the meet as an olympic a world record holder and a top seed and by the way i still had a printout from that meet somewhere and that's you know that shows uh, the head you know the heading going to the final um olympic record poland and the world record poland the only time in the history that ever happened um so first of all we, we went through the side door with the advice of my coaches because they wanted to avoid me being, uh, you know, questioned. Uh, and I want to have a little privacy. We still got cornered by some, by some uh, uh, reporters and stuff, which was highly unusual for me because, you know, I was a sidekick. Arthur was the flagship and, you know, some, you know, interviews that, that were conducted before was, hey, Arthur, what do you think? How are you doing? Everything else. Oh, by the way, Marius, what do you think? You know, so I had an easy job. And now all of a sudden, I became the guy that they want to want to talk to me. So that was a little weird and overwhelming. But my coaches did a great job of kind of keeping me uh, grounded. And, uh, uh, you know, my, my original coach who was in there, my club team coach in Poland, uh, always said the thing that I didn't understand at that time. He goes, for better or for worse, you are the biggest ignorant I've ever met in my life. 
And, you know, at times I took it as a, um, uh, you know, as a slap in the face. Uh, but I didn't understand that until much later. Uh, you know, I, I was always the kind of guy that, uh, you know, if I got beat, I was smiling and, you know, hey, good job and move on. You know, I never carried any of that with me. Um, and the same thing went with, you know, really realizing the uh, gra gravity of the situation. Um, you know, I went into the finals not approaching it in any different way. As a matter of fact, I think I was more relieved going to the finals because I have achieved my goal. You know, I was in the final. I was a top seed. You know, cameras were in your face. You know, again, I, I was able to shake that off. Um, I was going into race. Um I was going in to win. That didn't change. So this wasn't a moment that I said, okay, well, I, I, I've arrived. Don't have to do anything. But I was going in into it knowing that everything else that I do is just going to be an icing on the cake. And, you know, that really helped me um, have a, you know, I had a better swim at night. You know, and, and, you know, when I talk to people and they say, well, you know, you were top seed, but you got fifth. I said, yeah, but I was, you know, uh, to me, that was historical. You've, you've got top eight, 84 Olympics. It took a second faster than a gold, not second, couple of tens faster than a gold medal from 84. So 84 gold medalists would make top eight. That's the first thing. Second, um, uh, you've had three people break world record in a final. Uh, you know, that's a pretty competitive field. I went a second faster in the final. And, you know, unlike others, I didn't have a luxury of, all right, well, I'm just going to swim to make it to the finals. I swam all out in the morning because I had to. So going at night and going a second faster, I was very proud of my effort. I had no regrets. I didn't walk out of the water thinking, oh, my God, I just lost the gold medal. Um, no. I gave it a fair, you know, not a fair. I gave it, I gave it all, and you know, it. That's how he played out. i I was still very proud. I, you know, I'm in the books for Olympic record, you know, forever and ever, and that's always going to be a fun story for me to share. I, I love the perspective, right? Because going into the finals, most swimmers would say, "All right, I broke the Olympic record, and now I'm going to have a shot to go medal." For you, it was, "I have achieved my dream." in my life. So I'm going to still give it everything I got, but whatever happens, it's all good because I'm not afraid to fail. So, you know, talk about that. And, and some people, you know, and I, I do that at times too. I think to myself, is that something that takes an edge off of my performance or anybody else's performance? And I can't really speak for anybody else. I know it didn't take an edge off of my performance. I was a bulldog. I was, you know, if there is one thing that you can go back and talk to uh, my coaches, you know, I wasn't on every day. Nobody is on every day. But when 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 the challenge of practice came, I rolled up my sleeve, you know, and and I and I tried to get it done. I was I was you know a go getter. Um, uh, so going to the finals, even though I had an approach that oh you know I done this amazing thing, everything else is just going to add to that. To that. You, you didn't take the edge off of it. I was going to race, but it did, did alleviate pressure. And, you know, I had a plenty of adrenaline in my system. I was super excited, but I wasn't scared. And I think that was the biggest difference because when you, when you get up on the blocks and you start seeing yourself with the gold medal around your neck, uh, you know, it, 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 it can backfire on some. You know, I, I, I have no doubt that some people can work with that. But in my case, you know, I avoided looking at the outcome and continue to focus on the process. That's such an important mentality. And it takes a long time to get to that point. You know, you're 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds. They, they don't understand that yet you know, focus on process over performance. Is that something that uh, you, you talk about a lot with the athletes at Pinecrest? We talk a lot with athletes. We talk a lot with coaches, um, you know, and especially when in practice, you're going to have swimmers, they're going to struggle. You're going to have swimmers that, that are going to be not as good in practice. And, you know, focusing on your journey is very important. Understanding that 
uh, you all might end up in the same place, but everybody's going to take a little different route. You know, um, when I was swimming in college, I, you know, I had a great distance group and uh, uh, Dr. Heron, Steve Heron was a, a freshman with me, a distance freestyler. And I remember, uh, you know, uh, he, I, I came in in January and I, he broke uh, 15 minutes in a mile uh, in December meet. And I remember swimming with him in practice and thinking to myself, how oh, this guy broke 15 minutes. I mean, I'm, you know, they didn't adapt to me. He had his path. He was so ahead of his times. He was doing underwater fly kicks in a mile before anybody thought about doing that. But he was not as good in practice as maybe, you know, what, my stereotypical sub 50 miler should be, but he did what he needed to do to get to that point. And, you know, and what we try to do uh, with our kids, with our coaches to make sure that everybody understands and keep them focused, keep them focused on what it is that you do. And, you know, there's this great commercial. I, you know, I, I quote the commercial quite a bit. <laughs> it's a, it's a um, financial advisors talking about, you know, they showed this guy uh, running at the beach and passing everybody. And then this other guy just going and they show him at the end of the uh, journey beating them. And, and the point is that, you know, season, your swimming career is not a sprint. It's not something that you need to focus on this week, this month. It's something that you need to focus on decade, 12, 14 years and the proper development and the journey that you need to take to arrive at the ultimate goal. So what is your goal? Is your goal to be successful in college then, you know, let's not try to worry about uh, winning every single ju junior Olympics when you're 10 years old, because maybe that's going to change the path that you take. Maybe that's going to create, uh, you know, uh, um, a situation when you're going to use your bullets early in your career and, and go the wrong path. You know, it's not to say that it's not possible because it is but every person is going to be different and you comparing yourself to somebody else next to you that's doing something that's better than you when you're 10, 11, 12, it's not necessarily uh, uh, relevant to your overall development. Your path is going to be your path. If you're willing to work hard, if you're willing to listen to your coaches and if you're willing to build the um, basis for your future success, then you're building a long-term project rather than a sprint. So critical, I think, to understand that piece. And, and Marius, inside of that, talk about what it means at Pinecrest to be a great teammate. What it means, I, I don't think it's 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 a recipe for Pinecrest. I think it's everybody. You know, the good teammate is, you know, I use a term with our swimmers, be your best friend. You know, and, and a good teammate is gonna be like your best friend. He's gonna is gonna support you when you're struggling. He's gonna it's gonna create ish. It's gonna create a um, an environment for you when you uh, struggle. He's gonna cherish your uh, your success when when you when you're being successful, and he's gonna support you through the whole process. Um. So, I don't think it's limited to Pinecrest, but the term "be your best friend," you know, starts with you as a person. Um, we often are a lot nicer to others than we are to ourselves. So being a best friend then creates a better teammate. A better teammate is somebody that is confident in your ability, that is uh, uh, first and foremost supportive of yourself, and then that becomes transparent in supporting others. What's one thing, Marius, that you could tell your younger self if you could go back and say, hey, listen, don't don't worry about these things. Keep focused on this. What what would that be? You know what? Listen to your coaches. Um, you know, I had a great coach growing up. I had a great coaches throughout my career. But I look back and, you know, and sometimes I, I wonder how they survived with me because I was a difficult child. I, I, I accept that and I know that. I was not the easiest person to coach at all times, but, you know, they stuck with me and, uh, you know, I am who I am because of so many people in the past. And if I can give, 
younger swimmers or younger myself one advice. I wish I would have bought into it earlier. Um, I'm not the kind of person that look back and says I have regrets. I don't. But I know for a fact that if I bought into all of that earlier, I wouldn't be. I, I would have been a. I would have. I would have been a different swimmer, um, and you know I would probably accomplish different things uh, in, in my career. So trust the process and listen to your coaches. Uh, you know, coaches will have your best interest in mind. What are you most excited about with our sport right now? And we're in a challenging time. So for- <laughs> I thought you were going to say, what's the most difficult? And I would have a list of things that we can talk about. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think what I'm most excited about is, is ISO. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, because that gives us a different platform that we didn't have before. Um, uh, you know, I think that ISL is going to make FINA, USA Swimming, and everybody else better because it is uh, making everybody reflect on how we do things, but also is giving a, a longer life to all those swimmers. Uh, and, you know, and it, I'll, I've always been uh, one that says that swimming produces the greatest amount of new swimmers every four years during the Olympics, because that's the exciting time. That's when swimming comes up, uh, you know, and it's being talked about. ISL now provides a live feed on the national TV, prime time right now, uh, you know, which is phenomenal because uh, it, it becomes a talk of a town now, not every four years. It's been really fun to watch and really fun to see how they hype it up. And uh, it leads me into some great final questions here for you. And these are some quick fire questions. So is it going to take, in your opinion, a sub 20 second performance in the men's 50 free to take the gold medal in Tokyo? Oh, my God. (laughs) Uh, That's a phenomenal question. And I wish I had a crystal ball to tell you. Um, That's a that's a big drop. So I'm going to say no. Okay. but it is going to take pretty close to that to you know i can tell you i can tell you for sure that i before a gold medal is going to be 20 i do believe that uh, uh, you know sub 21 is going to be and uh, um, uh, not a, not a glamorous performance anymore <laughs> okay now this one might be a little bit easier but a lot of people have different opinions is eight minutes going to get broken in the women's 800 meter freestyle? I, that, that will happen before the, uh, the, the 50 freestyle, yes. Yeah, I think so too. And then what swimmer, maybe with not the biggest name in the world, are, are you excited about going into these games? What's the swimmer that's not the biggest name in the world? Um, I tell you, I've been impressed with what Beryl Gastronella is doing for the LA Current. I mean, every race, she looks so good. You know, that's a tough one. You know, Haley Flickinger is also really having a great meet. Tom Shields is on his way back. Well, yeah, but Tom Shields is not, not a young swimmer yeah, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go... Um, I'm gonna go on a on a on a. Uh, I'm gonna say that the person that's gonna surprise us the most, we haven't we haven't seen them swim on a regular basis yet. I like it. I like it. No, it's not gonna be somebody that's ISL. It's not gonna be somebody that we treat as a household name yet. That's gonna be fun to watch. Whoever that is. Yep. Marius, thank you so much for your time. Love having you. It's great to see you again. I haven't been able to see you for a while because we've been all blocked up. Well, Mike, anytime you you, you want to change the climate a little bit, just come down south. Just don't do it during the hurricane season. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll plan on those uh, dark months of February and, and March here in western New York to, to come down to PC and visit. And, and on my part, I, I promise not to complain too much on Facebook about hitting 50s here. <laughs> all right. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in today with us. This episode will be up and live on our webpage uh, early this evening, and we will also have it on our YouTube channel. You can follow all of the Coach's Corners clips on YouTube. 
Marius, thank you so much for your time and energy. We really appreciate it. All the best to you and the Pinecrest family down in Florida. Thank you, Mike. And, and best of luck to you and Victor. Appreciate it. Okay, guys, we'll see you next time on Coach's Corner. Next Monday, we have ASCA CEO Bill Wadley. Thanks, Marius. Thank you.